Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. We want to continue this afternoon in our discussion of the Reformation, and I'd actually like to read a passage of Scripture before we begin. It's a very familiar passage to us all, so you don't have to turn to it, but it is um, um, appropriate for some of the developments in connection with the Reformation. It's 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17. <clears throat> But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise <coughs> excuse me, for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. What we see in the case of Luther and other of the reformers is when they get back to studying Scripture, that's when they become wise for salvation. They understand the gospel, and they understand the authority of Scripture in contrast to the authority structures of the time. So that was one of the great discoveries of the Reformation, as we will see and perhaps get into a little bit today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you that it is able to make us wise for salvation. We are born again by the living word of God, and uh, because it is breathed out by you, it is inspired by God, it is profitable for us in every way for life, for um, doctrine, for instruction, um, everything we need for life and godliness. We thank you for the way you've preserved your word for us, the way you have revived people through um, studying it, and we pray that that would be our experience as we study here at Emmaus, that your word would um, um, animate us and exhort us and teach us and make us faithful servants of Christ. Thank you for the ways in which that happened at the Reformation, and we pray that we would uh, be encouraged as we study this great period of church history. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so last time we left off looking at some of the different uh, interpretations of the Reformation, some of the terms. Um, surrounding the Reformation, some of the what we called indirect factors behind the Reformation, the intellectual climate, the, the, the moral state of things, some of the political economic issues. Uh, today we want to get into, first of all, some forerunners of the Reformation. Some other voices, earlier voices, that were challenging the state of things in the church and um, were, would say things that later reformers would also say and build on as well. Um, and then we will see if we can get into some of the direct causes of the Reformation as well. Who would you guess would fit under this category of Reformation forerunners? Wycliffe. John Wycliffe is right, uh, one, of the, one of the key ones. Any others? You remember from reading Shelley or other studies? There's one more key one we'll look at. John, another John, John Huss, right, John Huss. Wycliffe was, um, you can see his dates there in the 14th century, about 1330 um, to 1384. He was a, a theologian philosopher who taught at Oxford in England, 
and he began to um, challenge some abuses in the church, particularly surrounding the papacy, but also some of the, the beliefs uh, of the church at the time. And for this reason, he's often called the morning star of the Reformation. And he would challenge the church in ways that, that Luther would and, and other reformers. Um, one of the key uh, convictions that Wycliffe developed and that he saw uh, the church had gone amiss with is that the Bible is the only true source of authority. F.F. F. Bruce says of Wycliffe, quote, He does not appear to have grasped the principle of justification by faith with the clarity found in the, refor in the reformers of the 16th century. And that's true. Um, this would be, the teaching on justification would be clarified by Luther and others. So, so this is not where Wycliffe was so much. But Bruce says, on the principle of sola scriptura, he was wholly at one with Luther. So he was convinced that the Bible, the Bible was the ultimate authority, the sole criterion of doctrine to which church authority shouldn't try to add. Now, there's a lot of myth about Wycliffe. Um, that's true when you study great personages of history, legend, myth, and, and it's particularly true with Wycliffe. You get the impression reading some historians, earlier historians, that Wycliffe you know, was basically saying all the same things Luther said and that he translated the Bible all by himself and, and things like that. This is probably the most common myth that, that he was actually the one who translated the Bible into English for the first time. His name is connected with that, that first English translation. Um, more recent scholarship has demonstrated that this is not the case. However, some of his ideals were embodied by those who did translate the Bible into English. And so his name is attached. Even, even in uh, the years following his death, church authorities sort of blame him for the English translation of the Bible, which they didn't like, by the way. They didn't like the Bible getting into English. So although he wasn't personally responsible for promoting the work or doing the works, his followers were. His followers, anyone know what his followers were called? Kind of a strange name. The, the Lollards. The Lollards. This, is, uh, this was a kind of term of abuse. It was uh, uh, maybe equivalent to the idea of mutterers. I'm not exactly sure why they attach that name to his followers, but it was like so many um, titles in church history, they, they often start as, as very derogate, derogatory. One of the scholars who has uh, done a lot of work on w Wycliffe and clarified um, a lot, cut through a lot of the past legend and, and myth is a scholar by the name of G.R. Evans, in a, re in a recent biography of Wycliffe, Evans writes this, quote, There is no doubt that Wycliffe approved in principle of teaching and preaching in English. However, it is far from certain that Wycliffe translated a single word of the Bible into English. And there is scant evidence in the authentic writings of the last years that he was even thinking along these lines at all. Don't tell Wycliffe Bible translators that. Um, they might have to change their name to the Lawler Bible, which doesn't have quite, a, quite as good a ring to it, does it? Lawlards. Yeah. But again, it was uh, some of Luther, or Luther, Wycliffe's um, ideals embodied by the Lawlards. <clears throat> 
Now, the other thing to notice here is that this translation comes from the Latin Bible, the Latin Vulgate. This is not yet a translation from the original biblical languages. Um, as the Renaissance comes, we were talking about last time, I think, and this, this cry, ad fontes, to go back to the sources, back to the fountains, and learn the original languages, that, that will come later. William Tyndale will be the one who goes back to the Greek text to translate the New Testament. So this is, is, is not a perfect translation because it's from the, the Vulgate, but nevertheless, it is the first time that people actually have access to the Bible in English. The church was, was not happy about this, as I mentioned. In the 15th century, it becomes illegal to read the Bible in English. Think of that. The church is saying it is illegal to read the Bible in English. Um, Wycliffe was viewed as a plague that troubled the church. And in 1411, the Archbishop of Canterbury wrote to the Pope, and he said this, This pestilent and wretched John Wycliffe of cursed memory, that son of the old serpent, endeavored by every means to attack the very faith and sacred doctrine of, holy, of the Holy Church, devising to fill up the measure of, of his malice, the expedient of a new translation of the scriptures into the mother tongue, as if that was the unpardonable sin. Now, um, if, if Wycliffe didn't actually himself translate the Bible um, into English, what were, what were his other sins? <laughs> How did he make the church so upset with him? Well, one of the main ways, and you can see it from his conviction of, of scriptural authority, is the fact that he challenged the authority of the Pope. Um, he argued that Christ is the only head of the church. The Pope was considered to be the head of the church on earth. Eventually, he actually calls the Pope the Antichrist. And in fact, a number of the later reformers, that would be their view of the Pope as well. In fact, that becomes... Um, among the, some of the reformers and their heirs, heirs, H-E-I-R-S, um, that's the way they interpret the book of Revelation and its references to the Antichrist, the Pope. He questioned other things like the um, celibacy of the clergy. Perhaps most significantly beyond the challenge of, of the Pope's authority was his rejection of the doctrine of transubstantiation. He said it was a recent innovation, which in a sense was true. Do you remember when uh, the Catholic Church officially adopted transubstantiation? And all that, that comes later. 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council. Okay, so, so Wycliffe is, is writing in the next century. So he's saying this is a fairly recent innovation. By the standards of church history, that was certainly true. Um, he said Christ was not physically present in the sacrament, but spiritually present. Um, he also challenged the idea that the sacrament automatically confers grace to people. He, he argued that, no, no, you have to be a, a believer to benefit from the sacrament. You have to, th there's no profit if there's not love in your soul. And so because of this, he was imprisoned, uh, which shows how important... Uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation was by this time. Uh, he died of a stroke in prison in, in 1384. But uh, several years later, decades really, 
in 1415 at the Council of Constance. Now, you, we've talked about the Council of Constance before. That's where, you remember, the um, Great Schism and the, the, there was a point where there were actually three popes. It was the Council of Constance that sort of deposed the three popes and appointed a new pope. Okay, so at that same council, 1415, uh, he was uh, pronounced a heretic. Of course, he was already dead by this time, but he was pronounced a heretic. And um, some years later, 1428, the pope ordered that Wycliffe's bones be dug up and burned. And they, they did that and threw his ashes into the river. Wycliffe uh, didn't mind. He was not buried in the ground. He was with the Lord. Um, the Lollards, however, become a very important uh, um, group in, in England that keeps the spirit of the Reformation alive, the Reformation or Reformation ideas alive in England. Um, they were often persecuted, but... They will reemerge when we come to the English Reformation and talk about William Tyndale. So let's come now to John Huss. John Huss. Huss um, was a preacher from what we would identify now as the Czech Republic, but back then it was, back then it was known as Bohemia. So he's sometimes called the Bohemian Reformer. He was influenced by um, reading Wycliffe and apparently through some students who had studied under Wycliffe and returned to Bohemia. Now remember the, the common language for scholars of this day was Latin. So even though he was, he was Bohemian and, and um, Huss, or Wycliffe was English, Latin was the theological language that you would, you would write in. He came to emphasize similar themes as Wycliffe, um, but his influence comes through preaching. He seems to be something of a preacher. He's a, he's a pastor of a church. Uh, apparently, he preached to very lar large crowds, um, 3, 000, up to 3,000 people, apparently. And you can see from that, that number that he, was a po he became a popular figure, which suggests that Wycliffe did as well. He, he gained a number of followers, the Lollards. So Huss and, and Wycliffe and the fact that they have this following suggests that there was a kind of spiritual hunger among the people, that the church was not meeting. Um, because he emphasized these similar themes, he was eventually excommunicated by Rome, but he continued preaching in rural areas. And he preached, apparently, against the selling of indulgences. We'll come back more to that um, when we come to Luther, uh, because that's an important key to understanding the Reformation. He also wrote a book called The Church. And in this book, he argued that the church had Christ as its head, not the Pope, which, again, is what Wycliffe had said. And he went so far as to say that it was right to rebel against the Pope who, who erred. Interesting development happens um, that will sort of, Huss will be um, a warning to Luther later because of what happens. Huss is invited to the Council of Constance. Now, we just mentioned that. Wycliffe was declared a heretic at the Council of Constance. Um, Huss is still living during the time of the Council of Constance. So he was, he was um, invited to come, but people said, you know, don't go. They're, they're, gonna, they're out to get you. But the council promised him safe passage. That is, he could come. He wouldn't be harmed. He could return. Um, in fact, that promise apparently came from the, the emperor. 
the Holy Roman Emperor. It turned out, however, that they did not keep their word. Um, he was imprisoned. He was declared a heretic. And he, after he was on trial, he said, okay, thank you. I'd like to go home now. I was promised safe passage. But they did not keep good on their word. And it was justified because a promise uh, given to a heretic isn't binding. So, um, eventually, he was burned at the stake. Now, you might remember, if you've made some progress in Baton, which I'm reminding you every class to do, time is running out. Um, when Luther was summit, summoned to the Diet of Worms, Remember, people warned him, they're going to treat you like they treated Huss. This is a trap. Don't go. But Luther went anyway. Even knowing what had happened to Huss, Luther went. Um, before, before they burnt him at the stake, they asked him if he would recant. They gave him another chance. And apparently he replied with these words, I shall die with joy in the faith of the gospel, which I have preached. And apparently when the, they lit the um, flames, he died singing the words, Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. Hus, the name Hus, anyone know what the name means? It means goose. And so it's often said that Huss laid the egg that Luther hatched. It's a way to remember Huss, the Bohemian goose. Um, these men and, and their influence um, spawned movements. Um, many people recognized the need for reform in the church. And it shows that there were still lights burning for Christ um, before the time of the Reformation. Uh, however, the church as an institution had been very much weakened. It was in a weakened condition. And God in His grace raises up people like a Wycliffe, like a Huss, and then um, ultimately a Luther and others to help bring Reformation to the church. All right. Questions, comments? There were others we could mention as well, but those were the probably the two most prominent. Let's move now to direct causes of the Reformation. We've talked about some background. We've talked about some indirect causes. We want to move to some of the core issues um, of the Reformation. The first one... What would, you, what would you guess might be the first or the most prominent direct cause of the Reformation? If you were to launch a guess. Okay, but what about Luther? Okay, his 95 theses, but what led him to write those 95 theses? Okay, but why did he... Oppose the indulgences. The authority of scripture. There you go. Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura is often called the formal cause of the Reformation. And Sola Scriptura emphasized that Scripture alone is the sole authority in matters of doctrine and, and practice. So let's review a little bit of the background here. Uh, I trust this is review for you. Luther became a monk in 1505. 1505. And you remember the circumstances, the, the lightning storm and his vow to become a monk um, if God would, would save him through St. Anne. Um, really, he wanted to become a monk. 
this was the path to becoming a theologian, really. And, and this is what, you remember he was in law school, his, his father wanted him to, to be a lawyer, and so here was the occasion <laughs> for him to make a vow where he could become a monk and justify it, not as rebellion against his father. So he becomes a monk in, in uh, 1505, joins the Augustinian group. Luther, as you know, was a very intense guy, and um, he was on a, a quest for holiness, quest for heaven. Bainton says in, uh, in this book, Whatever good works a man might do to save himself, these Luther was resolved to perform. And these would have included works of, of charity, sobriety, chastity, poverty, obedience, fasting, vigils, mortification of the flesh. And you remember he spent, uh, seemed like, endless time in the confession booth, so much so that he wearied the priests uh, listening to his confession to the point where they would say, you know, Luther, why don't you go out and commit a real sin so you have something to confess here? <laughs> um, Luther would later write, quote, I was a good monk and I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I might say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. So he was, a, he was an intense monk, for sure. What this shows us is that Luther was trying every resource, pretty much, that the Catholic Church offered, um, whether that was good works or the sacraments, uh, relics. Remember, he made a trip to Rome, um, the merits and, and mediation of the saints, monasticism, all of it. And yet, he still could not find peace. He still could not find rest for his soul. He still felt that he was under the wrath of God. Now, the key to Luther's breakthrough and the key to Luther's discovery and, and change is that in the providence of God, he was assigned to teach the Bible at the University of Wittenberg. And so he began to study the scriptures. The study of, of biblical studies as a formal discipline or, or, or uh, curriculum of study was a relatively new development in the church. Um, and then it partly is connected to the Renaissance and its emphasis of ad fontes and going back to Hebrew and Greek. Um, and studying from the source. So, Luther gave himself to the study of Scripture. In 1513, he lectured on the book of Psalms. By 1515, he was working his way through Romans. And uh, 1516 through 1518, he, he was teaching through Galatians and Hebrews. Now, if you're going to discover the gospel, those are good books to work through, right? Psalms, um, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews. And Luther was immersed in these studies. It was kind of, they had a really cool system back then of university studies. I, I think personally that we should reintroduce this, this system. Basically, you would come to study under Luther and, or the, whatever professor, and basically you would learn whatever he was studying. So there were no set courses. It was not like you enrolled in the Psalms, and he taught the Psalms every you know, fall semester. No, it happened to be he was studying the Psalms, and the students came in and listened to his studies. And they learned his method. They learned how he handled the text. And next he went on to Romans, and so they learned <laughs> Romans. It wasn't like he taught the class Romans. It was what he was studying. Isn't that a great, great idea? I'd love that. Um, I don't know if Mrs. Beatty or Dr. Beatty will go for that or not. Um, so 
he's immersed in the biblical text. He's studying, he's studying these great uh, biblical books. Baton says these studies prove to be for Luther the Damascus Road. And that's really true. It was as he studied scripture, he began to see the importance and centrality of Christ and, and the cross, and the light begins to dawn. Also significantly, um, as, he's, as he's teaching at the university, he's also appointed people's priest, which meant that he was preaching. He was a regular preacher. Because he was studying the Bible, he was preaching the Bible. And he was confronted with the pastoral needs of the people. So all of this in the providence of God was, was, was really at work in Luther's mind and heart. And through, through the study of Scripture, through the preaching of Scripture, he became convinced that the church was not preaching the biblical gospel. And it was through his study of the Scripture that he became convinced of what that gospel was. Um, again, just by way of background here, the sort of general attitude or understanding of, of uh, salvation at this time was expressed by the slogan, quote, God will not deny grace to those who do their best. God will not deny grace to those who do their best. It's kind of like our slogan, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, or another, another way to express it, God will not deny grace to anyone who does what lies within them, which is a very Pelagian idea. Remember the debate between Augustine and Pelagius. This Pelagian idea that you were able to work out your own salvation. You had the power to do that. Now, of course, you had to use the church's means, the sacraments and, and things like that. Another major development um, that was of great significance was Erasmus's um, publication of the Greek New Testament in 1516. Um, again, with the advent of the printing press, this made this, uh, this work available. Um, Luther, Erasmus also provided a fresh translation of, of Latin, which was kind of a radical thing as well. But, but uh, Luther devoured this Greek New Testament. In fact, as, as Alistair McGrath says, it is perhaps no accident that the event that is traditionally regarded as sparking the birth of Protestantism took place only a year later when Martin Luther nailed a document to a church door. In other words, 1516, Greek New Testament is, is uh, printed or published. 1517 is when Luther nails his theses to the, the door. When Luther, and, and at this time, 1516, 15, even 1517, even when he posts the, the theses on the door, it's not clear that his mature, formulated understanding of justica justification had been totally worked out at this time. You look at the 95 Theses, and it's not quite the later Luther and his understanding. But the, the sparks of it, the seeds of it, were certainly there. And he was, a, he was certainly recognizing the abuses of the church um, and the indulgence system and things like that. So in later years, when Luther reflects on the work of God through him in, in this, what we call Reformation, um, here's what he said. And this is kind of a classic Luther statement. You get sort of his brashness, but also his devoutness and his view of God and all of it. He says, quote, I opposed indulgences and all the papists, but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept, or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends, the word of God so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word, of, the word did everything. That was Luther's understanding of, of the Reformation. So you can see this principle of, of sola scriptura um, 
you can see why that would be considered the formal cause of the Reformation. Certainly Luther would have thought that way. Um, it's often said that if the, reform, if the reformers dethroned the pope and his authority, they enthroned scripture. Again, a little bit of background as to why this was such a, an amazing thing. I mean, why didn't the church, um, why wasn't the church preaching the word of God? In the later Middle Ages, it's really true that, that the church, and by the church I mean regular people that would identify with the church, they, they did not know Scripture. Scripture, we might say, was not unleashed on the church, and, and that's what the Reformation did in many ways. Um, so that was the problem. B before 1505, when Luther uh, was appointed a prof professor, uh, when in fact he was a university student, um, he speaks of, of, uh, uh, of a time when he, he was in the library and he saw uh, a scroll of the Bible chained to a lectern and apparently it was um, um, open to 1 Samuel. And he talks of dreaming about the day of actually possessing his own copy of the scripture and being able to read it and study it for himself. So that gives you a window. Even university students did not have ready access to the scriptures. There was no real teaching ministry that was grounded in, in the word of God. Um, theologians would be able to study scripture in the universities. And... That's the way they wanted to keep it. And to get back to, to um, Aaron's question about you know, why, um, this, this was not new. This was kind of uh, the pattern of life in the later Middle Ages. Pope Innocent III, who was writing in 1199, made this statement. The secret mysteries of the faith ought not to be explained to all men in all places. For such is the depth of divine scripture that not only the simple and illiterate, but even the prudent and learned are not fully sufficient to try and understand it. <coughs> so that's why they didn't necessarily even teach scripture, because it was so deep that people couldn't understand it. So just, you just follow the church and what we tell you and, you know. So the Bible's just for the experts, for the official church in, to interpret. Lay people could not be trusted with the Bible. Uh, we get a little bit of insight into the problem by something that Johann Eck, remember that name from Baton, one of Luther's opponents? Eck said this, quote, Scripture is not authentic without the authority of the church. Wow. Scripture is not authentic without the authority of the church. You see what's happening there with that, that kind of statement? Scripture is made inferior to the church. And Luther, the reformers, could not accept that. Um, the church, they would argue, is born through the word of God. So Luther asks, who begets his own parent? That's really what Eck you're saying. Who first brings forth his own maker? No, Luther said scripture is the authority in the church. And the church had moved away from, from that. That's why the, 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 the reformers believed that the institutional church was in darkness and, and needed to be reformed. One of the phrases on the uh, Reformation memorial wall in Geneva um, is another Latin phrase. We talked about the five solas. Um, this Reformation phrase is, I don't if I can remember the correct spelling, Post tenembras lux. After darkness, light. After darkness, light. 
And so that's what the reformers saw the institutional church as being in darkness because they had ec eclipsed the authority of scripture with, with their own authority. Um, and so a fundamental plank of the Reformation becomes sola scriptura, return to the centrality of, of scripture. And that's when the gospel really is discovered. So, so that's why it's so important as we think about and step back and reflect on church history. This is why it's so important for us to continue to emphasize the importance of Scripture. You remember Augustine's testimony? Um, you remember he hears these children saying, take up and read, take up and read, and he was troubled in soul, and he takes up a passage from Romans, and he is saved through that. The same with Luther, really. It's, it's when he is immersing himself in Scripture that the light, dawns. Um, and so that's why I opened with 2 Timothy 3.15, the scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ.